Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. Welcome to a special presentation of the On The Tape podcast. Dan Nathan, Danny Moses, Guy Adami here on a Monday. In just a few minutes, famed economist Nouriel Rabini will join us off the tape. He is the author of Mega Threats, and this is a book you need to read, especially in the environment that we find ourselves in. For the first 100 people that leave a review of the On The Tape podcast, we will send you a free book. Just contact us at contact at riskreversal.com. A lot going on this week. Apple seemingly... um, throwing a monkey wrench in things they said just a couple of weeks ago. CPI this week, Facebook higher. Why is that happening? Just a lot to talk about here. Tesla, either side of $200. Dan, how are you? I'm doing well, guys. All right, Monday, this is always fun to do these bonus pods here, and I'm really fired up for for Noriel and talking about mega threats. Guy, as you like to say on the tape, you were born in the Wall Street of what could go wrong, will go wrong. Um, Noriel's book, I am like midway through this thing, and I really wanted to kind of keep this thing away from the two of you right now because there are so many themes that you guys have been talking about on the tape since we started nearly two years ago when you talk about leverage and debt and central bank policy and all these things. I mean, he also really kind of spends a lot of time on how these are really affecting each other. When you think of some of these other things of geopolitical and climate change and immigration, I mean, the list goes on and on. It's a fascinating read. So please leave us a review, send it to AD at contact at risk reversal.com and we'll send you a book. All right. This, you know, guys, it's interesting that you mentioned Apple here, you know, less than two weeks ago, they reported, right. And they, they talked about China and they talked about, you know, the demand and supply dynamics with, you know, zero COVID. They manufacture a lot of phones over there. The supply chain, are oriented over there. They also really rely on a lot of demand over there. And at the time, it was the only one of the five mega cap tech stocks that gapped up after its earnings. Remember that? So we had Microsoft, Amazon, Alphabet, and Meta all get murdered. And this one gapped up. Well, it's filled in the whole gap. They basically pre-announced for this quarter, they're basically saying that they're going to have a few million less phones available um, to be made and to be sold over there. So stocks down here on the flip side of that, Meta, which has been down, what, 30 some percent over the last few weeks here, huge gap after their earnings is up six and a half percent as we talk because Mark Zuckerberg's announced some big layoffs. So it's just kind of interesting when we think about gaps in the market after pieces of news, Carter Braxton Worth likes to say gaps like to be filled. Well, Apple's filled its upside gap. Meta is trying to kind of fill at least a portion of that. So one dog going one way, the other dog going the other. What do you want from me? Danny? What do you want from me? And I would submit, and listen, I understand why you would interpret the Facebook news as layoffs being bullish. I also listened to um, Barry Diller this morning on the Squawk Box. And when they asked him about TikTok, he basically said it's going to be banned here in the United States. So I think Part of that is filtering into this equation as well. We'll see. But, Danny, you saw what you like to call a Friday night dirty on, as it turns out, Friday night. Yeah, two things before I get to that. When stocks enter value stock territory like Meta is, it'll trade up on cutting announcements. If you're a growth stock and you do that, you get killed. But I think Meta has entered the the time period where, okay, it's kind of basing here maybe. I don't know. I'm not a buyer. I'm not, a, I'm not shorting here, but I just wanted to mention that. That means it's in the, the hands now of value buyers versus growth. 
So we've been talking about the buy now, pay later uh, sector for over a year, more than a year. And I covered short now, cover later is what I, I think I called it at the time. But a firm, which is one of the largest ones out there, remember, started by Max, Max Levkin, right? Technology genius whiz, right? Um, and they said, oh, we're not a bank. We don't have to worry about it. It's nothing. Well, guess what? When you have to build loans on your book to then sell them to investors as part of your platform, which is what we've been talking about, and you can't get it done. Well, Friday night, it turns out, this happened a couple months ago with them. They had a $350 million ABS deal, which is getting pulled because it's it's pricing too wide. What do I mean? They can't afford basically to sell those loans at that price because effectively, it costs them money to originate loans onto their buy now, pay later platform. When uh, Powell makes a comment about how short-term rates shouldn't impact the consumer, I think he fails to see the fact that those costs get passed on. What does that mean? It means buy now, pay later rates go higher. It means auto loans. We're seeing in the auto loan sector and ABS go higher. So again, something I'm also paying attention to, the stock is down reflecting it. So let me focus on also another name here that's piercing $7 to the down. That's Carvana, which was over 300 bucks, as you guys know, last summer. Ernie Garcia II, again, is going to take a company to zero and sell stock all along the way. Remember, he was the ugly duckling. So when I worked with Steve Eisman in the 90s and Vinny as an analyst, that was Ernie Garcia II, who was also involved in the SNL crisis. So again, people, before we get into Tesla, which I think is pertinent to this, it's the people behind, right, that run these companies is very important from a corporate governance perspective. So I wanted to highlight a couple of those names. That was another dirty that kind of came out over the weekend, Dan. Yeah, well, we got to talk about this Tesla here because, again, you know, this stock was trading about three hundred dollars a little more than a month ago. Right now, as Guy said, it just pierced that two hundred dollar level here. Carter Braxton Worth on Worth Charting, our friend, um, has a really detailed um, technical note out this morning um, on Tesla. It doesn't look good, and really, to me, you know, it's interesting because we know that the deliveries came in uh, lower than expected. We know that zero COVID is having a big impact on them, both from a manufacturing standpoint, but obviously obviously also from a demand standpoint. And, you know, we've seen this, it's kind of interesting, you know, with Apple, for instance, you know, if you're relying on, you know, a, a, a China, for instance, for a big part of your future growth, you know, it's a tough road to hoe, especially as we see increasingly nationalistic economic policies here. And so I just kind of wonder, you know, market share for Tesla in China has gone in the last couple of years from like 25% for EVs down to like 15 or so, you know, so to me, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem like this is specific to Tesla at the moment. I, I really, Danny, I'm, I'm curious what you think with Elon tweeting all day, if you are a Tesla shareholder, aren't you getting a bit more concerned about how he's spending his time? You just nailed it. So, oh, he's 80 hour a week, 100 hour a week at Twitter. So if you're a Tesla shareholder and you don't care about Twitter, you care about actually Tesla, you got to start to ask yourself the question, what is going on? Because this guy's running SpaceX, he's running Tesla, he's now running Twitter. But here's what's really interesting about it. You are getting a firsthand look for people that don't understand his personality or never know. He runs Tesla just like he went into Twitter fires the board, even though Tesla does have a board, we know that they're absolutely powerless, does whatever he wants, makes these rash decisions, violates federal and state labor laws. And let's not kid ourselves. Tesla only exists because of, of state and federal funding, the EV credits, the loan in New York to build the plant up in Buffalo that he was, but all those things, he only exists because then he throws it right back in your face. So let's be clear here. This is just math. He has 13 billion in debt. The revenues or profits from Twitter will not cover that debt. I wonder if in these debt covenants somewhere or where he has pledged more stock, because remember, he has not sold any Tesla stock. There hasn't been anything reported to kind of fill that two to three, four billion dollar gap that he needed to close. Where is that? Did they lend him the money based upon his stock? So you might see the two worlds converging. And you're right, Dan. I mean, he took off more here than he can swallow here. We've, we've been saying for a while that 175 was going to prove to be support in Tesla. It looks a lot more um, looks a lot more accurate now than it did maybe a few weeks ago. And I'll just mention this, not the dog pile on the rabbit, but the ARK ETF continues just to sort of melt down. Now trading with a 34 handle, Danny. Um, I think it's within earshot of a 52-week low and levels we probably haven't seen since the spring of 2020. So Jack Huff from Barron's does his podcast. It's called Barron Streetwise. It came out over the weekend. He had Scott Galloway on and they had Brett Winton. Okay. That's like, a, I mean, that's like a fire and a matchstick. I mean, Brett Winton is the, from ARK Invest, he's their futurist, right? And they were talking about Twitter and Tesla. Everyone should go listen to it or read it. But when you think about that, you know, guy in that context, I, I wrote this thing. There is no 
investment criteria for Tesla. You just believe in Musk. And the whole thing about Twitter and SpaceX and, and Tesla has been about Musk's brand. And Musk's brand is being damaged here by the second as he gets exposed. So to me, Tesla doesn't trade on fundamentals. It trades on his brand and it's being degraded by the second. But everyone should listen to that and you realize what you're really up against. If you want to go buy Tesla, more power to you. But you should listen to what the arguments are on both sides. And here's the other thing. We've been talking about this for a while. He is literally single-handedly through his tweets alienating the next Tesla buyer. You know, like, like think about this one. This just hit. OK, this is Monday morning here. Elon Musk, who has 113 million followers. I think that's more followers than anybody on the platform that he owns himself, okay, that has 330 million monthly active users that gets broadcasted to billions of users, okay? So this is his sole mouth, please. He tweeted, two independent-minded voters shared power curbs, the worst excesses of both parties. Therefore, I recommend voting for a Republican Congress given the presidency is Democratic. Think about what's going on right here. I just think it's really dangerous. And, you know, I've been saying this for a long time. And, you know, Danny, you have to, from a very different perspective, I just think he's like a really dangerous guy. I think that he, like, literally, you know, remember he was in, like, the early Iron Man movies. He was kind of like this avatar for Tony Stark. And you know what? We didn't get Tony Stark. We got a Bond villain. We literally got a guy who literally says that he's doing this for humanity. And I just don't buy any of it. And you look at how he's using the platform here. So listen, man, I think it's peak Musk. And I think to your point, why are we talking about the price of Tesla and talking about a chart? If this thing goes materially lower and he has pledged all of like a lot of stock, right? We know that he sold a lot of stock, to put up for the equity. But Danny, your point is, to fill the equity gap from the April sort of commitments that he had, he was either going to have to sell stock or he's going to have to pledge a stock. And the lower Tesla goes is the more likely that he has margin calls. Okay. So if you are a Tesla shareholder, you are bearing all of the risk of what he does or doesn't do with Twitter. And I got to tell you, I don't have a position right here, but I've never wanted to see so many banks that actually put up the capital for the debt who are wearing it. And I'm hearing from people as you are too. They are literally the opening bid is like 50 cents on the dollar. Okay. Like for when they're going out and trying to syndicate this. Okay. And then all of these equity holders, I mean, are you kidding me? Six or seven months after this deal was committed at 44 billion, Jack Dorsey, who co-founded this company, rolled his two and a half percent position into the deal, into the private sector. You want to ask how dumb this guy is think about it like like think about the exit that he got and he rolled it into it and i don't know if you saw this he's actually going back and forth on twitter with elon over the course of the weekend about how he's basically thinking about the platform and that thing this thing's a mess and it really can be the downfall to your point i think of this tesla stock and dan just to put that back together you're 100 people have to put twitter and tesla together because of the reason of, of what musk has at risk here so that's 100 right so his personal stake in tesla which would cause the stock to unravel if he was forced or got margin called on it what happens to twitter is going to have an effect on that and let me just say this he's exactly who we thought he was he's a narcissist he'll pull he would have said the opposite if it would help him he needs the republicans in office to stop these investigations into him it's that simple he does whatever's right in front of him so we can move on from that, but that's basically it, guys. Before we get to Noriel, real quick, it's worth mentioning. Obviously, the whole EV movement was on the back of hopefully getting away from fossil fuels. But as we sit here at the end of September, I think it was September 27th, the OIH was trading around 205. As we sit here right now, it's about to make a new 52-week high, trading around 316. I think the high was made back in June. And the stealth rally in some of these oil service names, Danny, that we talked about last week with Vinny and Porter to me is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, in the coal names in particular. So when they were on the podcast the other day, Peabody, which they mentioned, Peabody, Peabody, B BTU had reported, and the stock kind of was up three bucks and kind of pulled in, and they were buying the hell out of it that day around 23, 24. And you saw what happened. You have natural gas, which I believe, Guy, if I'm not mistaken, someone look on their fact set machine, but uh, natural gas is spiking again today. That normally has a correlation directly to coal, but they came out and basically said that they're not, that they called off the merger with the company in Australia. And that was kind of the overhang that prevented that stock from moving higher. But yeah, I think there's still a lot of money to be made here. One thing I think is worth pointing out, there was an article today on Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic Bank, a lot of these kind of high flyers that cater to high net worth individuals and companies specifically in the technology space as it relates to Silicon Valley, stocks have gotten hammered. 
And I'll say it again, this is going to be the time for active investors to make a lot of money. And even if you're a mutual fund, it's not about the XLF, it's about what's in the XLF, the divergence in that sector alone. And that has been massive. And again, I would tell people, do your bottom up work, it's going to pay off a lot. When we come back, the author of Mega Threats, 10 Dangerous Trends That Imperil Our Future and How to Survive Them, Danny Moses, right up your alley, Nouriel Rabini. Introducing event contracts from CME Group for individual investors who want a new, less complex way to trade some of the world's most recognized futures markets. They're smaller, lower cost, with predefined risk. Event contracts let you trade your views on daily up or down price moves in equities, gold, oil, and more. The markets you know and use every day. Take a position by choosing a side with event contracts from CME Group. Learn more at cmegroup.com slash event contracts. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. What's up? Guy here. Did you know FactSet is the official data provider for risk reversal media? FactSet is the key to all of our analysis. It's not just charts. FactSet provides insight into the top headlines of the day, private markets, and sector-specific data. If you ever have issues, get help from their support team that is committed to your success. Visit FactSet.com to experience the power of FactSet and request a free trial and unlock access to the tools that matter most to you. Nouriel Rabini is a professor emeritus of economics at NYU's Stern School of Business and chairman of Rubini Macro Associates, LLC. He has served in the White House and the United States Treasury. He is also the author of the new book, Mega Threats, 10 Dangerous Trends that Imperil Our Future and How to Survive Them, available now wherever books are sold. Nouriel, welcome to On the Tape. Mary Shelley. Edgar Allan Poe, Dean Kuntz, Stephen King. All these authors are authors of fiction, and they're terrifying. But what Nouriel Rabini wrote is not fiction. It's nonfiction, and it's equally terrifying. Nouriel, how are you? I'm doing really great today. It's wonderful being with all of you guys. It's great having you. And listen, we're reading your book, and I think it is a must read. And we were just talking before the podcast, and you said this is the most important book you've written. Speak to that, because if you think about it, when you make that kind of um, superlative, that speaks volumes. Well, it is the most important book I've ever written for the following reason. Uh, I'm an economist. I believe in comparative advantage. And usually I write about the economic, monetary and financial issues and risks. But they realized that in our world today, these uh, economic and financial risks are interconnected with many other ones. There are social and political risks, there are geopolitical risks, there are environmental risks, there are health risks, there are technological risks coming from AI, machine learning, robot and automation. There is a risk of deglobalization and fragmentation of the global economy. And I realized that each one of these mega threats that I discuss in the book affects the other and is affected back. It's like a 10 by 10 matrix where everything in a holistic way is interconnected. So all these risks are connected to each other. We cannot talk about economics without talking about politics and geopolitics. We cannot talk about geopolitics or environment without understanding the financial implication and the economic ones. So it's a bit ambitious because usually people say, stick to what you know best and to spend a long time understanding politics, geopolitics, environments, science, technology, and things I didn't know as much about. 
I take an economic angle to this issue, but I'm trying to connect all these threads together. That's why it's my summa in some sense. Well, you know, Noriel, I, I'd love to get a sense of kind of when you started thinking about putting this all together in one book. Was it the start of the pandemic where we saw a lot of these mega threats kind of smash together? And then we saw a lot of very unprepared organizations, whether they be governments or, or central banks or, you know, um, international organizations not really ready for the sort of event that we had unfold over the last couple of years. And I'm just curious. And again, you know, I've been reading this and it is a fascinating read. The idea that you put them all together and how they might intersect, as you just talked about, is something I really wanted to keep this book away from Danny and Guy because, um, and, and they it was unavoidable, but these are all themes that we talk a lot about. And the ones that I know, you know, are, are forefront for us is central bank policy, is debt and leverage. And, and a lot of the way our listeners think about how those affect their investments and, and, and the like. But talk to us a little bit about when did you conceive of the idea of putting this all together in one book. Uh, you're right. I conceived of it at the beginning of the COVID pandemic because this was a major shock to the global economy. But then I realized that the policy response is going to eventually lead to inflation, but there will be also negative supply shocks that will lead to a recession. And the combination of the two will be stagflation. I'm old enough with gray hair. I remember the 70s when we had two major oil shocks. And we had that stagflation. And I realized it was not just about stagflation. Compared to the 70s, when we had stagflation, now we have also a mountain of debt that we did not have in the 1970s. So not only are we going to get stagflation, but like after the GFC, we're going to have a debt problem. But during the GFC, we had a debt problem, but we did not have an inflation problem because of the demand shock, credit crunch. Today, instead, we're facing the worst of the 1970s with a series of severe protracted negative supply shocks that are stagflationary. And at the same time, we have debt ratios that are four times for US and advanced economies as those that were in the 1970s. So both private and public debts. So not only we're gonna have inflation, not only we're gonna have recession and stagflation, we're gonna have what I call a stagflationary debt crisis with the mother of all debt crises. On top of it, we had first time ever a major pandemic in a long time. We saw in those years also the beginning of escalation of the tensions between China and the United States, and not just between China and US. We saw what happened between Russia and Ukraine, the escalation of the tensions between Israel and US on one side and Iran. So I realized that we are not only in a geopolitical recession, we were in a geopolitical depression that was similar to the one that occurred in the 1930s, where you had a bunch of revisionist powers, violent, aggressive, authoritarian coming to power. And these powers were challenging the economic, social, political, and geopolitical order that the US, Europe, and the West had created after World War II. These are revisionist powers like Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and increasingly also Pakistan, and their allied to each other. And this geopolitical depression would lead to a cold war between US and China. This cold war is gonna get colder with the risk even of a hot war. And I predict in advance when people did not expect it that Russia would invade the Ukraine in December of 2021, I saw it coming. And I realized that in addition to the geopolitical consequences, this geopolitical depression is gonna lead to a decoupling to a fragmentation of the global economy, to balkanization of global supply chains, to a division of the world in two warring economic, financial, technological, political, currency, and monetary system. And that will be also stagflationary on top of the risk of having even violent war and potentially even World War III. This is something that people are starting to talk seriously about even in Washington, that this escalation from a cold war that's becoming colder could lead to essentially to a hot war. So we would be lucky, as even my friend Neil Ferguson said in a column recently, if we only repeat the 1970s when we had stagflation. But we have a risk of repeating what's happened in the 1930s with the economic and financial meltdown, and then 1940s, where the rise to power of authoritarian aggressive regimes in Germany, in Italy, in Spain, and in Japan led to World War II. So that's the danger we're facing. 
economic crisis, financial crisis, debt crisis, but also political and geopolitical crisis on top of an environmental problems becoming more severe and a situation which pandemics are becoming also more severe in part because of climate change and where now liberal democracy is being challenged by extremist parties of extreme right and extreme left all over the world. And on top of it, we have now the layer of AI, machine learning, robotic automation that's gonna increase the economic pie, but make it more unequal and lead actually to a backlash because it's gonna cause massive job losses and permanent technological unemployment. This is a perfect storm. Actually, it's worse than the 30s and the 40s because at that time they did not have to worry about AI. They did not have to worry about climate change. These are new threats that are specific to our times. Noriel, just to bring it back to the markets for a second, we were in lockstep with you in 2006 and seven. You were in our offices. We were a subscriber to your newsletter. And I think for the people that only see you as, you know, Dr. Doom or whatever, you're all, you want to be Dr. Realist, which is what yeah. you are. And you, and you talk about everything with such passion and knowledge. But I want to just say one thing that you highlighted in your book that I think is the key for, for all these investors right now is that I don't think that you believed and I didn't believe that the governments globally would bail out the system as much as they did or that they would have needed to do that. And the moral hazard that has been created as a result of that, just want to slap people a little bit in the face and wake them up. That to me is a key ingredient in all of this is the lack of acknowledgement of the moral hazard that's been created by the central banks and how painful it is and going to be to unwind that. Can you talk about that, please? Uh, absolutely. One thing has happened in the global economy, this massive buildup of private and public debt. The sum of the two globally in the 70s was 100% of GDP. By 1999 was 200% of GDP. Today is 350% of GDP and rising. In advanced economies, 420% of GDP and rising. In China, 330. In the US, that debt ratio, private and public is higher than after the Great Depression and after World War II. And we have not coming out of a Great Depression or a major war. Why this buildup of debt occurred? There is a long factors about it. We always kick the can down the road. We don't want either to raise taxes, to pay for the spending when Democrats are in power sufficiently, and we don't want to cut spending enough when Republicans are in power to cut taxes. So there is a bias both on the right and on the left towards deficits. And there's a bias towards deficits in good times. And there's a bias, of course, when there is a recession. And it's not just the buildup of uh, public debt, but also of private debt. We democratized finance because people wanted to keep up with their Joneses and their income was not sufficient to pay for their own consumption. And therefore, we created the mortgage crisis. People were using their home as an ATM machine. And now we have democratized it again by having this day trading on Robinhood and so on. The young people that are skillless, hopeless, incomeless, wealthless are gambling their future by gambling on this platform. So again, it's a way of building up leverage and debt. But one of the major factors is monetary policy. Whenever there is a bubble, central banks don't do anything to deflate it. Their view, and this was the philosophy of Ben Bernanke, who wrote several papers, was when a bubble goes up, we cannot essentially try to control it because he says it's like trying to do neurosurgery with a sledgehammer. You're going to kill the patient. But then when the bubble bursts, because there's going to be an economic and a financial shock, you have to bail out people. You have to ease monetary policy. You have to backstop the banks, the non-banks, the household, the corporates, and the governments. But that creates a massive moral hazard because in a Good time, debt continues to rise, and the bad times with easy monetary, fiscal, and credit policy becomes even more of an incentive to build up debt. So debt goes higher and higher and higher. We had the Greenspan put, then we had the Bernanke put, then we had the Yellen put, now we have the Powell put, and it's been every central bank doing the same. So there is a huge interaction between this buildup of debt and very loose monetary and credit policy that they essentially They've allowed the creation of this debt trap. But the paradox is that now we are in a debt trap. There is so much private and public debt that if central banks now are trying to fight inflation by increasing interest rates, not only they're going to cause a hard landing of the real economy, they're going to cause a hard landing of financial markets, equities, bonds, credit, 
private equity, public equity, real estate, and so on. This year, everything has gone down. And that's going to imply essentially that they're not willing and able to fight inflation because they are in a debt trap. They're not stupid. They're not, uh, how to say, evil, but they've built up such an amount of private and public debt that now any attempt to fight inflation is going to cause a financial meltdown. That's why I think they're going to blink, they're going to wimp out, and eventually they're going to accept higher inflation because the alternative of an economic crash and a financial crash is even worse. But they created this problem over the last few decades, every year after year. We got to hang out. We have to hang. We have to have a scotch. We have to hang out. So here's I'm going to ask questions in a row. So bear with me. That arsonist, I mean, that economist Ben Bernanke won Nobel Prize for economics. When you saw that, what was your initial reaction? Because I know mine was. Well, my initial reaction was it was a mistake. And I'm being polite. Yeah. Mistake because his entire academic research on how you deal with asset bubble and the burst was the wrong prescription. Do nothing when there is a bubble and then clean up the mess and bail out everybody when it bursts first. Secondly, he underestimated the severity of the financial crisis in 2006, 2007. Tim Geithner, Janet Yellen, the Fed were telling him we have a massive mortgage problem. It's gonna go bust, they're gonna have a banking crisis, a recession. I was saying it more loudly, he was not listening even into the crisis said it's going to be a mild economic slowdown. There's not going to be a banking crisis. And he's supposed to be an expert, of course, of banking and financial crisis. And the policy response was delayed and then what became excessive in terms of creating type of tools, zero policy rates, quantitative easing, credit easing, backstopping, household, corporates, banks, non-banks, money market, commercial paper, eventually high yield, high grade during the COVID crisis that led to this wide array of monetary tools that did not even exist. No one 20 years ago had heard about ZIRP or NIRP or QE or credit easing. He created that toolbox and it's become now standard and conventional. And it's becoming even more unconventional because from conventional we went to unconventional and now people are talking about modern monetary theory permanent monetization of fiscal deficits is something that even Bernanke has spoken about and written about two years ago. He said, when there is a severe recession on a temporary basis, we may want to monetize fiscal deficits. He wrote it. He's on record of having that view, that actually temporary MMT might be the right policy to deal with an economic and a financial crash. So I respect him, but I think he made many analytical and policy mistakes. Yeah, and that's being nice. Him and Stephanie Kelton can hang out and go over their MMT together because that's madness. I've said this. Well, she wants permanent MMT. Fair enough to him, he wants temporary MMT. But this MMT. Yeah, well, I mean, I think temporary becomes permanent, but, but <laughs> that's, that's, that's neither here nor it's there. It's a slippery so, slope. I've said this, and I'm curious as to your thoughts. I've said amongst the many villains of the 21st century, and there's a freaking laundry list. Central bankers are going to be at the top of the list. And you said something before. They're not evil people. They're not malicious people. But they're people with way too much power that don't understand or at least have no comprehension of the problems that they've created. Thoughts on that? Uh, I, I do agree. I, in some sense, you know, they were in a bind because we had, first of all, fiscal policies, whether when Republicans were in power or Democrats, that led to a lot of buildup of public debt. And then if you try to use monetary policy then to fight that, you're starting a fight with fiscal authorities and monetary authority usually say, we don't want to tell the fiscal authority what they should be doing. Then the fiscal authority decided, in addition to public debt, we're gonna democratize finance and allow people that cannot afford homes, they cannot afford auto loans, they cannot afford student loans to borrow like crazy and build up their debt. So we created a public debt trap and a private debt trap. Once that happened, central bank de facto started to say, okay, uh, we're going to try to ease the pain by having relatively easy monetary and credit policy. But by doing that, they created the moral hazard. They gave incentives to private and public agents to borrow even more. And when things really became bad, like during a recession or a crisis, you went to very unconventional policy. 
not just reducing interest rates, but zero, negative, quantitative easing, credit easing, effective bailout of everybody across the board. And that created even more of a debt trap. So essentially, the fiscal authority were initially the one that made the mistakes, but then the monetary authority essentially, instead of taking the punch ball away as it should, they fed essentially the fueled with more liquidity, this crazy buildup of leverage, debt, risk taking in the private and the public economy. So it was a synergy between the fiscal authorities and the monetary authorities. And it did not matter whether there was a Republican in power or a Democrat, center right, center left, Tories, progressive, and so on. This problem occurred in the US, in Europe, in the UK, under different types of administrations. So this is not a partisan issue. Everybody was essentially was drunk at this party and we built up the mother of all debts and now the mother of all the debt crisis. Until now, every time there was a crisis, there was deflation, so we could ease even more. Today, for the first time, we have inflation. So we cannot do what we did after the GFC and after COVID of going back to the same zero negative rates, QE, and credit easing. We have to do the opposite. And that's when the system is going to break down. Noriel, so you talk about explicit debts and Im- implicit debts in the system, and you're talking about pension funds. We just got a glimpse of what can happen. What you just described was Bank of England and what's going on in the UK when you can't print your way out of it because it becomes more inflationary, right? Or pick your poison, you can you can start to try to inflict higher taxes, which will slow the economy. Either way, you're kind of on the other side here of Goldilocks, so to speak. So can you talk about that? Because it feels like that's a microcosm, the BOE of what we're about to see across the world. Well, in addition to the explicit debt of the government, uh, local government, central government, federal, there is what I call implicit debt. that are the unfunded liabilities that are coming from pay-as-you-go, social security, pension, and healthcare system in aging population because you have less workers and more retirees and the taxes of the payroll taxes of the workers are paying for the benefits of the retiree. People have estimated that the size of this implicit debt in a typical advanced economy is about 100% of GDP. When the average now of the official public bonded debt in the advanced economy is around 100% of GDP, in some countries in Europe, larger. So not only we have a massive amount of explicit debt, we have also a massive amount of implicit debt. And in the past, we resolved the problem because we didn't have aging yet, and we had migration. We let people come in the country to increase growth, increase the labor supply, increase the payroll taxes. Now for economic, social, and other reasons, we're stopping and we're essentially having the same migration policies under Biden as we did under Trump. Same thing in Europe and around the world. So we have a huge buildup of debts, and these debts are becoming increasingly unsustainable. And these debts are now interacting, as I pointed out, with this negative supply shock. So that's why I call it not only the mother of all debt crises, not only the new coming great stagflation, but the great stagflationary debt crisis. And unfortunately, central banks are them if you do and them if you don't. Even if we didn't have a debt problem, given the negative supply shock, the reduced growth and increased inflation, then they have a huge problem because either they fight inflation by raising rates enough and they cause a severe recession, or if they care about growth and they don't increase interest rates, they're going to cause a de-anchoring of inflation and inflation expectation in a widespread spiral. That's a traditional problem, but now they have an additional problem of financial stability. Not only when you raise rates to fight inflation, you cause an economic recession and a severe one, severe because there is so much debt in the system and debt servicing ratio are gonna rise as you raise interest rates. But on top of the economic crash, you're gonna cause a financial crash because there is so much debt in the system that even going from zero rates to now closer to four. And bond yields have gone only from 1% to 4%. What has happened this year? Public equity S&P 500 down about 20%. NASDAQ more, private equity down, growth stocks, tech stocks, venture capital stocks, all down, public rates, credit market, high yield, high grade, leverage loan, CLOs, 
all crashing. And usually when you have a 60-40 portfolio, equity and bonds, when you make money on equity, you lose money on bonds and vice versa. Risk on, risk off, growth and recession. That assumes that inflation is low because when inflation is rising, even gradually, what happens is the discount factor for equities goes higher as bond yields are higher. So you lose on the equity side, like you did this year, about 20%. But an increase of long bond yields, 10-year treasury from 1% to 4% this year implies that the price of that bond has fallen by about 25%. So you lost money, more money on your safe bond this year than you did in your equities. The correlation that is negative between bond prices and equity prices became positive when inflation is rising. So there was nowhere to hide. You lost money on equities, private and public, on real estate, on credit, and on bonds, and even on cash, because the nominal value of cash doesn't change, but inflation wipes out the real value of that. So this is a situation when you have a problem you created with stagflationary shock, too much debt, and the need to fight inflation. It's an economic problem, but it's a massive also loss of financial wealth across the board. There was almost nowhere to hide this year. So, so Norio, you just described a, a lot of the kind of ripple effects we're seeing from just, you know, the, the, the debt splurge that we've seen globally. Where do you expect to see, you know, the first blow up? You know, people have been kind of pointing to China for, you know, a decade or so. You know, we know that the U.S. was ground zero for the mortgage crisis that kind of kind of morphed into a global debt crisis, right? And some people would say that it's been a rolling debt crisis really since, you know, the mid aughts or so. Where are we likely to see kind of the next phase of this? Because you are literally looking out in the book, you know, like two decades here and saying it's coming. Where do you think it really kind of gets uh, going here? And is is it in the U.S. where, again, um, we're kind of first to all of those, you know, you talked about ZERP and you talked about quantitative easing. You talk about in the book how we went from, you know, uh, under a trillion dollars, um, you know, as far as the Fed's balance sheet to now we're nearly 10 trillion and we can't even roll that off. So where does it all really get going? Well, you have to be very precise by looking country by country and balance sheet by balance sheet. Within each country, there is the balance sheet of households, of corporates and the private non-financial business sector banks, shadow banks, the government, central and local, and then the country overall. And depending on the country, the stresses are different. I would say to generalize the following observation, during the GFC was mostly a problem of balance sheet of households that borrowed too much for mortgage debt and excessive leverage and restaking of the banks. It was not just the US, you had the housing bubble going bust in Iceland, in Ireland, in Spain, in Dubai, in Italy, in Greece, among others, because there were housing bubbles all over the world. So it was household and regulated banks. After the GFC, the household balance sheet improved gradually, not because they saved more, but because they defaulted, and therefore they reduced their debt through default. And then we regulated the banks, Frank Dodd, Basel III, with more liquidity, more capital, and so on. So the buildup of the debt, because we had very loose monetary policy for a decade after the GFC went, however, into one, the corporate sector, the shadow banks, and the governments. Corporate sector, because you had high yield debt that started to explode, became very cheap with spreads on high yield very low. You had all the fallen angels that were formerly investment grade, and they became below investment grade because of their leverage, a trillion dollar of those types of debts in the U.S. alone for fallen angels. And then with the buildup of private debt, not just traditional bonded high yield and high grade, leverage loans, CLOs, cov light, and other forms of private debt. And the, those risks became also excessive, especially because the covenants on that private debt were extremely loose and dangerous. By the way, before the COVID crisis, the Fed was writing their quarterly financial stability reports. And there were all of them about the buildup excessive of the corporate debt that was excessive leverage and so on by some fraction of the corporate system. Of course, if you are an Amazon or a Google 
and you are growing very fast, you're not very leveraged, you're not going to have a problem. But there's a good chunk of the corporate sector that is highly leveraged, high yield, private debt, CLOs, and you name it. The Fed was warning about the buildup of step and on the financing, it was occurring through shadow banks, hedge funds, private equity funds, debt funds, and so on and so on. So that was the nature of the risk, not just the US, but also in many parts of Europe and advanced economies. But the paradox was there were many zombie corporations and businesses on the onset of the COVID crisis, and they should have gone bust. But during the COVID crisis, what did we do? Went back to zero policy rates, quantitative easing, credit easing, even buying high yield, not only high grade corporate debt for the first time in US and continue to do so in Japan and Europe. We backstop money markets, commercial paper, and the fiscal staff backstop every business in the land. Household, corporate, small businesses, and big businesses. So the zombie, highly leveraged corporates that the Fed was worrying about, they should have gone bust. Not only did they go bust, they were bailed out and they borrowed even more. So we created even a more of a leverage problem in the corporate sector. But now the party is over. The entire CLO market in the US and the leverage world market in the US right now is almost shut down. The spreads have become so high that the issuance starting in October is going towards zero. And this is only the beginning of the problem. We don't yet have a recession and high yield spreads are 600 basis points above treasury. In other shocks in the past, mild shocks, they went to a thousand. So that risk of the corporate sector and their leverage is only starting to build up even before we have an actual recession. So the time bomb right now for the US and many advanced economies is not households and banks, but corporates and shadow banks. In some advanced economies like the UK and so on, there is also a massive buildup, of course, of public debt. And with reckless fiscal policy, we know what the market discipline is telling you when you have a reckless fiscal policy. We're not yet there in the United States, but we could be there if and when we get into a recession. Of course, then around the world, you have emerging markets. Many of them, the World Bank IMF say, about 80 of them are there under severe debt distress. They left to either default or orderly restructure their debts. And they have shocks with higher interest rates, higher inflation, negative terms of trade shock when they import raw materials and commodities, and having a weakening of their currencies because the dollar is becoming stronger. So it's like a triple whammy for a large number of fragile emerging market and frontier economies. And in Europe, we have a shock to energy that is worse than the United States. Same thing in the United Kingdom. That's why in Europe, inflation is already now in the UK and the Eurozone, double digit and rising. And the Bank of England is already officially predicting five quarters of negative economic growth. And the ECB is already officially revising their forecast to say, most likely we're going to have a recession. The Fed is still delusional to believe they're going to avoid a recession. I think it's mission impossible. But in the US, we're not yet there going to get there quite soon. So the debt problems are across the world, advanced economies, emerging markets, frontier economies, poor countries, and whether it's households or corporates or banks or shadow banks or government, in some sense, it doesn't matter because of the snowball effect from sector to sector. In the past, when you have a corporate debt crisis or a household debt crisis, the banks and the shadow banks go bust, then the government has to bail out the banks, and then you have a sovereign debt problem, like in Europe, and you have a doom loop between the banks and the sovereign. So it doesn't matter whether it's a sectoral problem. The sectoral problem from the private sector can go to the financial system and then to the sovereign, and therefore it becomes a bigger debt problem. That has happened in the past. It's going to happen again in this case. Toriel, so the multi-trillion dollar question, which leads back to all everything you're describing, to me, one of the biggest things that I don't know what's going to happen is U.S. Treasuries. Will they start to trade on their own profit and loss <laughs> income statement or will they be a flight to quality? Because everything that you're describing to me, if people believe that the full faith and credit of the U.S. is at risk, there's no bottom, obviously, to the market. So how do we kind of are we going to be at one to two percent treasuries here in the next you know, 12 to 18 months? Or are we going to shoot up to six or seven on a credit worthiness aspect? Because that's always been the biggest 
question for me. Well, the U.S. is lucky because the dollar is still the major global reserve currency. And often when there are risk of episodes, people go into the safety of the U.S. dollar. And this year, because of still the lingering effects of COVID, because of the risk of stagflation, because of Russia, Ukraine, and because of the tightening of monetary policy by the Fed, people have gone into the dollar. While, of course, long-term treasury yields have gone much higher because you have inflation in the system. So you had the situation in which, in spite of a stronger dollar, money is not flowing enough into treasuries to reduce the yield. The yield goes higher, okay? But at least the dollar for now gives you the ability to finance this large U.S. Back, uh, budget deficit. And with some exception, like March of 2020, when there was a liquidity shock and even bond yields were going to the roof, and even safe currencies were falling in value, and even gold was falling in value, everything was falling in value because you had a liquidity crunch and a panic, usually people are still going in the safety of the U.S. dollar. Of course, if there'll be sovereign debt problems, they're going to start in the United Kingdom, or maybe in Italy, or eventually in Japan. The advantage of advanced economies compared to emerging markets is that they can borrow their own currency. Unlike emerging markets that have dollar debt, and therefore they have to default when that is not sustainable. So I don't see a formal default in advanced economies. I see more a situation in which if the market imposes discipline and you cannot finance yourself, the central bank is going to print money. That's what happened in the UK, where the Bank of England wimped out as soon as there was pressure on the bond yields. And the same thing would happen in Europe and the United States. Of course, if you prevent a default by printing money even more so, when there are concerns about your debt sustainability, then what's going to happen is you're going to cause even more inflation, more the anchor in inflation expectation. Bond yields are going to go even higher. So you can postpone that problem, but you cannot avoid it. So you can wipe out the real value of nominal long duration debt at fixed interest rates to a bout of unexpected inflation. It's already happening right now. But unless you go to very high inflation, you're not going to reduce the real value of that government debt like Argentina did or Zimbabwe. And I don't expect hyperinflation. I expect high single digit inflation. So you can fool all of the people some of the time. You cannot fool all of the people all the time. So if central banks are going to now start to monetize these deficits because interest rates are going higher and they want to prevent the economic and financial crash, inflation expectations get the anchor. And then the long term debt that comes to maturity has to be refinanced at much higher interest rates. And the short-term debt that comes to maturity has to be refinanced at higher nominal and real rates. Real because when inflation is high and volatile, there is an inflation risk premium. So you can postpone the debt crisis by a couple of years by having unexpected inflation. But then when nominal real rates go higher, then you'll have a real debt crisis, at least for the private sector, that cannot essentially be monetized. The public sector can always have the central bank printing money for it. But eventually you get a debt crisis. Thanksgiving at your house is going to be a barrel of laughs. Let me tell you something. I, I pay money to be at that table. And I agree with everything you're saying, which scares the shit out of me. Chinese are our biggest adversaries, without question, in terms of economies. I mean, you say what you want about Russia and all those things, but I mean, I fear the Chinese. And listen, you say what you want. They've invaded us in a number of different ways, not least of which TikTok, I mean, completely undermining the fabric of the country. I watched a great piece on 60 Minutes last night. Um, but speak to me about a country that is willing to lose many, many battles in order to win the war against an adversary in the United States that has a time horizon of about seven minutes. How do you win that? It's hard because right now there is a clear cold war between the U.S. and China. And who's going to win that war, by the way, is not only going to dominate the industries of the future that are all a combination of AI, machine learning, IoT, big data, 5G, and how you connect them together to provide goods and services. But as uh, Eric Schmidt and Eric Kissinger have written the recent book, whoever's going to dominate AI is going to also dominate politically, militarily, and geopolitically the world for the next uh, 100 years or so. So that great rivalry is not only economic and financial and technological, is who's going to be the dominant geopolitical power in this century. Whether it's going to be a relatively liberal democracy 
with a social welfare system and market economy like the United States or an authoritarian, increasingly aggressive uh, state that is based on essentially a form of state capitalism. So that's the risk that we're facing right now. Of course, what has happened is, and it's important, the US on October 7 of this year declared war against China. You'll mark that day as the beginning of the war between US and China because US decided to sharply reduce the ability of Chinese to buy semiconductors and semiconductor equipment and people that deal with those businesses for Chinese military and civilian advanced application to AI, machine learning, quantum computing. That's a declaration of economic and technological war. What we did with Huawei was spare change. We had to do it because the Chinese are gonna then use those semiconductor and equipment to win that battle. We had no choice. But remember, from a Chinese point of view, that's not anymore competition, it's not anymore rivalry, it's an attempt of the US to now contain China. And I'll remind you one thing that happened before Pearl Harbor. The US was seeing the threats coming from Japan and decided to limit the exports of what? Scrap metal and oil to Japan. Japan considered that one such a threat to their own security that they went for Pearl Harbor. And that Cold War became a hot war. The Chinese are seeing this declaration. We had no choice as the declaration of economic and technological war against us. And they're going to go hardball against us, starting with restricting the exports of rare earth metals and minerals that are necessary to build the green metals and the semiconductor and so on. So this will be an escalation of the economic and technological war. And that escalation is going to lead to an escalation of the tension over Taiwan, where 50% of all semiconductors in the world are produced and 80% of the high end. This is, a, this is an escalation that from a cold war goes to a colder war and it could eventually lead to a hot war. And the head of the US Navy last week said that Chinese may attack Taiwan not five or 10 years from now. He said as early as 2024. All right, so I ask you this next question. It's kind of tied into a lot of, of what you just talked about here. And, and I ask you this at the risk of losing your blue check and possibly having your Twitter account suspended, okay? If, 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 the, if Elon Musk doesn't like the answer here. But you know, to us, we've spent a lot of time talking about Elon and Tesla, okay? Elon just probably overpaid for Twitter um, maybe by $25 billion with his $44 billion price, okay? And, and he did it, as he says, for humanity because he loves us, okay? This is the richest man in the world who bought what he thinks is the most important town square. He has 113 million followers on Twitter. There are only 330 million monthly active users and that list probably goes lower, okay? So now all of a sudden, this guy who actually is very dependent on China for rare earth materials, like you just mentioned, for uh, manufacturing, for um, sales, demand for his electric vehicles, right? And so he cozies up to the Chinese for Tesla, but then he says he's all in for free speech on Twitter. And then we see him using Twitter to parrot Kremlin talking points about the war in Ukraine, right? That sort of thing. So to me, you know, and we've talked about this a lot on our pod, He's a really dangerous guy. He might be the most dangerous man in the world, given his resources, now given this platform that he has. And I'm just curious your thoughts on that, because we spent a lot of time thinking and talking about him. I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of others out there who are making some of these really important decisions who should start be should be thinking about what he's up to here. I fully agree with you on Elon Musk, and I've been very critical in recent days of what he has done with Twitter and other statements he's made uh, on Twitter. And if I'm gonna be banned, so be it. I, I don't care, I speak my mind. The point about Elon Musk is not only the risk is gonna allow anti-Semites, racist, Nazis, white supremacists, weirdos of every sort using this platform to really threaten and let even our adversaries, because there are thousands of trolls in China, in Russia, 
in Iran, in North Korea, they are trying to create misinformation and disinformation. So it's delusional when he says there's unlimited free speech. That's a joke. We know there are limits to free speech and we should not let either criminals or terrorists or enemies trying to destroy our, our own democracy from within with misinformation, disinformation. But the biggest threat from Elon Musk is not Twitter. He is a total appeaser, not only of Russia, but especially of China. Smart investors like Warren Buffett realize we're on a collision course with China, so they're getting all their investments out of China, their financial investment. Unfortunately, Elon Musk has the huge factory in Shanghai of Tesla cars. It's delusional to believe that the Chinese are going to align not only to sell electric vehicles, but autonomous vehicles that are going to use which kind of technology? Because to have autonomous vehicles that move together, millions of them, without hitting each other, you need what? AI, machine learning, big data, IoT, and 5G. You think the Chinese are going to allow the US, uh, how to say, 5G system to be used in China? Of course not. And we're not going to allow the Chinese cars with their own 5G to be used for our own autonomous vehicle. So he's tossed in China. And it's becoming now a pizza because it says that Taiwan should get the same kind of deal that Hong Kong did of a special autonomous essential region. What a joke. I was just in Hong Kong this past week for three days, and Hong Kong is not anymore what it used to be. It's a ghost town. It's really depressing what has happened. So in order to cover his ass and his own financial investment in Tesla in China, he's now telling us, let's give up on Taiwan. They will have massive geopolitical consequences because if we lose Taiwan, we have zero credibility to defend Japan, South Korea, and all our allies in Asia. We are completely lose all credibility. And then the U.S. role in Asia is gone for good. That's why it's dangerous, not just on Twitter. His geopolitical views on Russia, on China, are driven by his own economic and financial self-interest. He's talking his book like when he was talking up Bitcoin and shit coins, and then Russia, and now China, and so on. It's really a scandal that somebody like this can actually use a bully pulpit like Twitter to manipulate the prices of literally cryptocurrencies. He takes a position and then says, buy Dogecoin or buy Bitcoin, and he makes money. The SEC should start investigating what he's doing in his platform. He's using it for his own financial interest. That's a scandal. William Shakespeare wrote The Tragedy of Julius Caesar. Um, the soothsayer warned Julius Caesar, and the soothsayer proved to be correct about the Ides of March. My fear is, Nouriel, you're going to prove to be correct about everything you just talked about for the last 40 minutes. We want to thank you for joining us here on the tape. And folks, run out, run, don't walk to your favorite bookstore and buy Nouriel's book. It's also available on Amazon or any other online. You can get it of course hours. it is. Most bookstores, by the way, are sold out. If you go around New York City, you cannot find a copy. Yeah, literally. Well, so here, you're better off buying it online. Well, well, here's the deal. For the first hundred of you who leave a review and send AD a review, a screenshot of that review, you're going to get it in the mail. Uh, so thank you, Nouriel. This was fascinating. We hope you'll come back um, whenever you want, man. Nouriel, it's great being here. I just, worry that, I just worry that if you're right about all of this, there is no next book. We'll just be huddling together in a tent somewhere. <laughs> but thank you for coming I'm, on. I'm really working appreciate. on making this a, a better world. I want yep. to avoid the doomsday. And the book is about what are the threats, and we still may have some time to fix it. It might be too late, but it's a warning shot. It's not by saying we're doomed, but we have to start acting now. Thanks once again to CME Group and iConnections for sponsoring this episode of On The Tape. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find our show and we love hearing from you. You can also email us at onthetape at riskreversal.com anytime Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod, and we'll see you next time. On The Tape is a risk reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. Mm-hmm.